Hey everyone, welcome to week 41. This is day one. This is gonna be our week of interpreting our reference. So one of the things uh, we get the most messages about is reference. And people always want to know, you know, what a reference looks like. And uh, this is the week where we're gonna share it and we're gonna speak about how to turn that reference into painted decisions. So let's see how we do. Okay, let's get started. This is going to be day one. This is our new theme for this week. I was going to call it at first reference. You know, simply put, I was talking about the reference photos that we would use when painting from photographs. But I thought that it would be helpful if instead of just pointing at the reference, instead of just saying, hey, this is a reference, let's just paint this and that be the week. I think it's best if we call this week interpreting our reference because honestly that's kind of what we do i mean even if even if our aim is you know one to one trying to mimic trying to copy the manner in which a photograph sees nature you know if we're trying to say my job in painting is just to translate that photograph into paint trying to do it one to one as faithfully as possible so you're going to translate the way that camera and that lens interpret contrast, interpret depth of field, interpret color. If your goal is to say, like photorealist painters did in the 70s, uh, if your goal is to say, I just want to evoke a photographic language through my painting, um, I want this to be a purely mechanical thing, I don't really care about drawing, I want to project my drawing, I don't really care about speaking of the material qualities of painting. No, I want my painting to literally look like a photograph. I think this is where there is a disconnect. I think when people often hear about other people using photographs as reference, they believe that what they're doing is closer, is more akin to the philosophy that was behind photorealistic paintings. And here's the issue that I have with that. Ever since photography was invented, it was understood by painters as another tool, as another thing that you could, you weren't obliged to do this. I mean, nobody was telling you you have to paint from photographs, but it was something that painters could use as an aid when trying to solve a painting. This is a choice. This does not mean that because something exists, we have to use it. But it can make some things possible. You can paint things that would otherwise be literally impossible to paint. So it is very, very important to understand that ever since this was invented, mid 19th century, it has become a tool that is there to help us if we want to. Again, if we want to. For me as an illustrator, remember, you know, I went to school and I graduated as an illustrator. I have this deep, profound love for illustration. Reference was something that was absurdly important. For example, if you take away all the interactions that Norman Rockwell had with all the people that surrounded him, for example, you know, the last place he lived in, in Stockbridge in Massachusetts, he knew all his neighbors. He knew everyone in town. And he knew who could help him as a model for a specific painting. And he would call upon those people who would gladly pose for him. Even posing for those photographs was a wonderful experience. There are tons of stories about people just lovingly recalling how Rockwell would direct them as to how they should pose or the emotion behind the pose. And even Rockwell would have photographs taken of himself just so that he could access the emotion. He would always do these grand gestures of what he was looking for in his models when he was posing. If you take away photography from Rockwell, I mean, you would still have a remarkable painter because he could obviously paint and draw without photographs. I mean, he was an absolute genius. Photography was an absolutely integral part of the way he arranged a picture. He even accepted, and, and I don't know why we've judged as shameful the fact that we use photographs, but he even said, hey, I would use an opaque projector, a projector, and he projected his images onto his uh, surface, you know, wherever he was painting or drawing. And that's the way he did his color sketches. That's the way he did his drawings. That's the way he did the underdrawings for his paintings. And again, this was a manner of working 
that actually made possible the fact that he would paint a post cover every two weeks, which is insane, which is absolutely insane. Photography as an integral part of picture making has been something that almost every single illustrator understood from the uh, beginning of the 20th century. That has been part of our practice. I was somebody who was brought up in terms of, of my artistic training. I was brought up by training from life. I had numerous uh, drawing from life classes. We drew from the model inside. We went outside to draw in the street, you know, people moving, interiors, exteriors. I painted the model from life. This was years of my academic training where I understood the value that working directly from nature has because it's very, very different when you have, you know, let's call it the full stimulus that you can get directly from nature as opposed to an interpretation of nature, which is a photograph. That is a very simple thing. We have far less information when we have access to a photograph and when we experience whatever we want to paint uh, directly from nature, our whole body is just engaged. We understand it as an experience. And this integral experience, it teaches us so much more than whatever we can get from working from photographs. Here's the thing, though, and, and we don't have to feel bad about this. When you are by yourself and you have the desire to do a painting and you have to question if you want to do it from life or if you want to hire people to uh, pose for you or if you just want to ask your loved ones to pose for you, you know, you're directly subjecting people to something that is actually very strenuous. If it's a model posing for you, that's wonderful. You know, they are used to doing that. If you're asking your kids, your mother, your loved ones, to just stay still for you because you want to paint. I'm not going to judge anyone, but I did that. And it's very weird. It's almost like we believe that we are doing this grander thing than whatever people are doing with their free time when they're resting. And we're just telling them, hey, I'm going to make this painting out of this. Maybe the painting comes out amazing. Maybe it's crap. But you have to stay still for me. And we really subject our loved ones to something that is very stressful. I mean, staying still is something that's very, very painful. I don't know if you guys have posed. I think that every single person that paints from life has to pose for someone else at some point. For Max and my friend Dorian Vallejo, they did a super cool portrait of me when I was young. And I remember I actually had asked Max if I could pose for him because I had no money. And I remember they gave us uh, 60 bucks at the end of the day. You know, Max would just fill in like a slip. I would take it to, I have no clue where, you know, it was a building, you know, on the west side. And uh, it was like this little window and I would just give that to the person and they would give me a, you know, a check for 60 bucks. And I would be like, oh my God, this is amazing. So Max was like super nice and super kind that he knew that I needed money. And he was like, well, you could pose for, uh, for class. And I was like, hell yeah. So I posed for uh, two weeks, which was roughly, let's say, 10 hours posing. I remember this as if it was yesterday. And this was like over 20 years ago. I posed with my head tipped because I was in this big chair. And, you know, I kind of tipped my head. And I said, oh, this is fine. You know, I'm totally fine with this. But when I had to take that pose after 20 minutes, I felt it in my neck. And I was like, oh, my God, this is like pinching a nerve. And... Every single time that I would get into pose and the pose was right and the pose was actually, you know, the correct pose is where it hurt the most, you know, where my neck was just hurting the most. I'm not really exaggerating here. I had a vasectomy. I think that this was more painful than, you know, my recovery from that because those 20 minutes were absolute hell for me. It was painful from the first minute that I started posing and I knew I had to hold it for 20 more minutes. And here I was and I was super respectful and grateful for Max for letting me work. So I really wanted to hold that pose. But I also realized that, you know, this is hell. This is terrible. And I did it for those two days during those two weeks. And I told myself, I can't do this. You know, I really can't. I, I mean, this is way, way too much pain. And I was probably too young and I don't have the personality. And I certainly didn't have the knowledge of my body to know, okay, this is going to be stressful for my body. I shouldn't take this pose. But I gave it a shot. And till this day, I, I remember those moments as being one of the most physically uh, stressful moments of my life. 
I am absolutely certain of this. I mean, it gave me mental fortitude, but I wasn't looking for mental fortitude. I was just looking for money. I wanted food and maybe a beer after class. That's what I actually needed. So working from life, and particularly if you want to paint people, you know, if you want to ask your fellow human beings to just pose for you, this is not as easy as people make it out to be. Your friends love you, but it's not like every single time you can tell them, hey, sit still. They can sit still for you for like 10 minutes. I mean, even 10 minutes, that's that's quite a stress. But when you ask them like, hey, okay, let's do 20 minutes and it's maybe gonna take me, I don't know, you know, three hours. People are like, oh, dude, that's way, way too much. Usually, Painters can do that for other painters because we know what that entails. We know that we are willing to make that sacrifice for another painter. But, you know, our loved ones, they shouldn't go through that. If we know the pain that we're going through just so that we can make an ugly painting, because many times they are unsuccessful paintings, we should never do that to them. I think many times we have to get off our high horse and say, you know what, I'm just going to take a photograph. That's totally fine. And I can work from life and I can actually go to places where they hire models because models are a super important part. And specifically, you know, academically, they are a wonderful, wonderful part of our education. So we can go to those places and there's, they are professionals. They know their bodies. They know, you know, the uh, stress they can put their bodies through and they can do an amazing job. But again, if you have a daughter and you're going to pose her and paint her from life like Repin did 140 years ago... Don't do that to your daughter. You know, she's probably going to hate you for the rest of your life. That's crazy. That's inhumane. So a beautiful painting came out of that. And I'm sure that when we see a great painting, all we can think about is just this beautiful painting. But if we take a step back and we think about the human being that's posing for that painting, that felt like the only thing they couldn't do was move, you know, that they had to hold this pose, then these experiences are not so wonderful. And again... If people are doing that for us very lovingly, we should at least, you know, pay them back handsomely, lovingly also, because that is a huge thing they're doing for us. When they pose for us and we can paint them directly, they are telling us, I love you. You know, I can stay here for three hours. I can not move. And you do your ugly painting because you think it is important for you. Uh, I would say that a good thing to do, if you want, you could do a sketch from life. You could take notes. You could actually write down, you know, the colors and how something feels. You could even do an oil painted sketch just to kind of capture the energy that's present there and then take a photograph. And now you have a photograph, a drawing, notes, and a color sketch. Those are all wonderful tools to make then a final painting if that's what you want to do. Honestly, that is worth considering, I would say. Back to the painting. I started off with a self-portrait. I wanted to paint a uh, dramatic version of who I am. You know, slightly tipped head. That's why I remember, you know, with the tip of my head, I remember that story about me posing years ago with my head tipped. But back to the painting, you know, tipped head. One side of my head is in light. One side is in shadow. Now... We're not talking about a very deep shadow mass. We're talking about a mass that serves as shadow when compared to that light mass. But we're not speaking about a huge difference in value between the light mass and the shadow mass. So as soon as I recognized that there was this very small difference between the range of values that were in my light side and the ones that were in the shadow side, I was like, I'm going to try something really cool. I'm going to leave my light open and I'm going to leave my shadow open and I'm going to concentrate just a little bit, just a tiny bit on my features and that's going to be the painting. That's what I want. A very big light mass, a very big shadow mass, big as in encompassing, big as in they're both masses that are swallowing up details. We are speaking more about the unity in light and the unity in shadow rather than thinking that my job when painting my portrait is just to paint a likeness that is held together by all the specific information that is inherent to the features. I've always loved this idea of being able to paint a great portrait. Great portrait in the sense that it is expressive, and it actually speaks about the person that is being painted. And yet, it doesn't have to rely upon being faithful to the 
translation of all the small information that is part of the features because we usually associate portrait with features we think that in the smallness of that information is where the likeness of that person resides in and I don't believe that I believe that there is something bigger about the way we understand people and it's not defined by minutia and I always think that real likeness is this broader understanding of a person and I'd like to believe I hope that I understand myself, you know, that I've been looking at myself, I've been painting myself for so long, that I know who I am, I know what I look like, and I know where my essence kind of lives in. And I was hoping that I could get that um, just by working, again, with a big mass of light and a big mass of shadow, and I was hoping that I could access what I know about myself through those things. So that's what that photograph was very, very useful for. It was just a reminder of wholeness in light, wholeness in shadow. You know, again, these big enveloping shapes. And um, even though there is more information in that photograph than the one that I ended up painting, the fact that there's information within that photograph doesn't mean that we have to paint it. You know, we can still be selective about the things that we want to paint, even when looking at a photograph. You know, looking at a photograph is not like this contract that you enter where you're supposed to just paint that photograph. There is nothing in the act of using reference uh, that says that you have to be absolutely faithful when looking at photographs. I mean, one of the most wonderful uses of photography in painting history, I believe, is the use of Moybridge by Bacon. That's a perfect example of how a photograph, I mean, sometimes a really banged up photograph, but how a photo can be interpreted through painting. Now, does that mean that we all have to go to those very expressive extents to feel like we are interpreting a photograph, like we are uh, taking distance from a photograph? No, again, these are all choices. Uh, if you want to be absolutely faithful to that photograph, great, you know, do a photorealistic painting. If you want to use it to produce a naturalistic painting where you know you have to be disciplined when looking at that information, fantastic. If you want to just use it as a starting point to do something that is far more expressive, excellent. If you want to use it to do something that is absolutely abstract, excellent. There are no right paths here. So I hope that by speaking about reference, we begin to understand it as just a simple tool. Um, a lot of people have asked, why haven't you shown your reference? Why don't you do it regularly? And my answer, honestly, is super, super simple. I want painting to be. I want the act of painting to be. I want the thing that ends up being a painting. My efforts were put into translating information into painted decisions. So I want my painting to be it. What usually happens, and trust me, this is not me being hesitant about sharing my photographs. This is just me saying, hey, let's just really, really concentrate and pay attention to the painting part of this, you know, to the actual making of the painting. And anecdotally, I feel we can do weeks like this where we can share our reference and we can speak about how we are interpreting our reference. And hopefully this week, I'll interpret it in different ways that you guys kind of understand the range of how I use that information. Hopefully that will show through, we'll see. Well, I'll be honest, sometimes I have personal photographs, so I don't wanna share those. If my mom let me take a photo of her just so that I could paint her, she's not letting me take a photo of her just so that I could share it with thousands of people. No, she wouldn't be comfortable with that and I have to respect that too. This is not a matter of me imposing myself as a painter and telling people, hey, you are my reference and uh, I'm gonna share you with the world because that is very objectifying. So again, hopefully, hopefully, by not doing it, we just concentrated on the act of painting and not just understand painting as a footnote to a photograph because that's, I feel, a very sad thing. So we started with my ugly mug. Um, the photos that I'm gonna work from this week, tomorrow, for example, I'm gonna paint the portrait of an artist friend and I already asked them if they were cool, if I could share the photographs. 
Um, if it's a painting of Fer, I'm going to talk to her and I'm going to ask her and I'm going to be fine as a father sharing that reference, for example. So that was a pretty cool intro, I think, for this, uh, for this week. A very simple painting, a very broad, I think, sometimes complex conversation about using reference. But I think it's a good starting point, I feel. So let's see how we do uh, during the week. So that's it for today. Thank you guys for hanging out. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Bye.